listening, I assume that you're actually going to, I'll say that now. The first thing you'll notice is it doesn't have an ARM logo on it. And uh, that, that makes you feel decidedly nervous, you see, because as a result of not having an ARM logo in, I've got to prove myself. So I've got to think of all the letters I can possibly add after my name, and I've got to say what I am. <laughs> because I used to be a person, and now I'm retired. Anyway, it is, as Simon said, an interesting time. And um, it's an interesting time to reflect, because I was with ARM for 18 years, and it's been around for 26 and uh, I was actually with the company who was the first licensee of ARM, ARM Technology as well, a company called GEC Plessy Semiconductors. And so I've actually known ARM pretty well from the beginning. So it was an interesting opportunity, thank you Simon, for, um, for me to think about what I think of as the major milestones that ARM has gone through during its formative years, the first 26 of them. Now one problem with history, of course, um, and it's like the future. The future has lots of potential. It's lots of opportunities. You can go wherever you want in the future. But the past, there is only one. There is only one actual past. But the problem is there is a million different interpretations of it. So although we all lived through the past, we all never know the whole story. So my interpretation of the most significant milestones may very well be quite different from other people's. So, for example, you'll notice somewhere along the way that there's a date in there which says Ian Phillips joins ARM, and I can imagine that other people's presentations wouldn't have that in as a major milestone. Of course they might. You can live in hope. Anyway, the other thing I feel obliged to say is that all data in this is come from public sources, so um, nobody is actually forcing me to, to not disclose any information. ARM is not trying to keep me silent or anything like that, but I think it does nevertheless illustrate that these are my recollections actually supported by information that I found mostly on the web. And it's interesting because if I hadn't done that, I would never have associated the dates in any kind of logical way. So, the first thing about ARM is it's much bigger than it seems on the outside. ARM, most people, even people in the technology world, do tend to think of ARM as sim simply a RISC CPU IP. That's the company. Um, if you're not even involved in technology, it's not a RISC CPU IP, it's a chip company. Um, but the thing about it is that most people who are in the industry don't realize just how much of it is underwater. Um, so clearly, somebody thought that it was worth 24 billion, whatever it was that, uh, that this ARM thing was going to become, and it certainly is worth looking then spending a few moments and looking at just why this thing is worth 24 billion. So, the startup. I've tried to keep these things slight, but if you want to ask questions along the way, please feel free to do so. The consequence of doing it is it will actually push out the, uh, uh, the start at the free bar time. There is bottles of wine distributed liberally around for those who can't wait. <clears throat> anyway, I suppose you could say that the, the major first milestone that ARM encountered was 1990, which was when it spun out of uh, Acorn, being pressed by Apple and VLSI Logic to essentially create CPU chips with a model which would subsequently become a fabulous semiconductor. Now, it's... Nobody knew who the prime customers of this were at the time. It turned out to be Apple, and it turned out that the product was going to be Newton. And we know what happened to Newton. Well, it was an interesting experiment on the road to the iPhone. But nevertheless, it was an interesting experiment, and as such, it failed. Acorn, the now, famous, the now globally famous uh, PC supplier, also suffered from the same problem. And so the two major customers that were perceived as being the recipients of these CPU chips uh, were rapidly going to fail. Um, <clears throat> the other thing was it was going to supply domain-specific processes, again using that fabulous model, to other people. So there was going to be other people, the like of Samsung, who would want um, CPU chips, and they never materialized either. And then uh, the ARM CPU development to proceed independently of Acorn and Apple 
that was really a case of acorn and apple not wanting to have they both saw the other as a competitor not wanting to see the CPU development being dominated by the other now of course the the main thing that was left was actually the last thing on their hit list and that was this long-term idea of selling CPUs as cores it was never the, the main reason that ARM was formed. So the thing that ARM is was the last on the list of things that it was supposed to be doing. Anyway, 1990, it span out of Acorn computers. <clears throat> so 1991, so fairly close to that date, um, GEC Plessy Semiconductors came along. That's me, actually. Uh, we were, in those days, were producing a... Uh, uh, an ASIC cell library. We had one of the state-of-the-art CMOS processes down in Plymouth and um, they essentially wanted to make their cell libraries better than, the, than their competitors and so one of the ways of doing that was to put a CPU core into, into the cell library and ARM was there with one. We didn't know what a CPU was, we didn't know what software was, we didn't know what design environments were or anything else like that but we had a cell which was called an ARM 7 cell. It went in as a result of that license. We never sold any, and as far as GEC is concerned, it was a total failure. So it was an investment, not a large amount of money. We got all of that list of, of devices plus software tools, and I can't really tell you how much it was, but it wasn't much. Um, the, yeah, we were the first money paying licensee. VLSI Logic had a similar scope license uh, but they bought it with founder's shares, so they were one of the shareholders on the original company, and um, GEC Plessy declined to do that. So it was in 1992 then, 1992-93, that the ARM IP business model comes to the fore, license plus royalty. We're kind of all familiar with that now, but um, it was pretty desperate, actually. ARM really didn't have any other strings left in its bow. Um, the uh, Newton had collapsed, Acorn was struggling, there were no new opportunities had come about. In fact, perversely, one of the biggest opportunities, and that was only for the ARM 2AS, which was basically an ARM 7, um, was a games machine company in New Zealand. And they were, they were buying uh, the ARM 250, which is an integration of that, a subsystem integration, and using it to control the games machine. Actually, they sold ARM 250s for at least 10 years to that company, but the total volume was probably a couple of hundred thousand altogether. It's a, an interesting sideline, but it was never going to make money. So ARM, by 1992-93, was actually pretty desperate. Um, <coughs> it had been done fairly sort of um, bold statements like, Declared, we declared our ambition to be the Z80 of the 90s. Any, any of those that remember the Z80? Um, the Z80 was everywhere at one stage, and so the, in the intention here was that ARM would be everywhere. That was the, uh, the statement, but ARM, of course, being 32-bit. Um, um, the AMBA, we created AMBA as a way, at least in a concept, to connect together systems. It didn't work. The thing that uh, Arm noticed was that it ought to be fairly energy efficient. And the reason for that was that it had conditional instructions. Every instruction was conditional, and therefore it ought to make slightly more compact code, and uh, as a result of which the argument was it should be slightly more energy efficient. Now, but nobody had any idea about with, whether it really was more energy efficient or not, but because the idea had been created and because we, ARM, were looking for, looking for any kind of commercial angle, then somebody measured the MIPS per watt figure. Now, this turned out to be an incredibly valuable marketing tool because nobody else knew what their MIPS per watt was. And so you could say, ours is a very energy efficient solution. It produces so many MIPS per watt. What does yours look like? And they would all go, gah. Yeah, no idea at all. And so this, the whole concept of the MIPS per watt, energy efficiency, came about because of that. Just a, a per chance exercise and the fact that we had a number, ARM had a number. 
and other people didn't. So anyway, TI became the third paying licensee in 1993. It's only important because, as I said, second was Sharp, and they were in 1992, I understand. Um, but the significance of TI is that TI took arm into Nokia. Um, anyway, by 1993, with those three licenses behind it, and some little business, but not very much, the ARM 250 and so on, uh, then ARM actually was profitable to, for the first time ever, and it's been profitable ever since. It's a small sounding achievement, but actually is a pretty good thing to be able to, to say. But by 1994, just one year later, ARM had opened its first offices in Tokyo and in San Jose. Just an office, just with one person in it. The person was a marketing person. But Robin, you've got to say it, had realized that um, if you want it to be a global presence, then you had to be present on the globe. And so they, you needed to interface with the local market to make sure that um, there was no um, excuse for not getting good service. The interface which was caused by hours, the interface that was caused by language, was handled inside ARM. It turned out to be a very good move. And of course, there is a lot more um, offices nowadays, but even in 1994, just four years after it was formed, then it was already properly aiming at being a global uh, operation. <clears throat> Now, 1996 is interesting, and this is in, these are in red because these are things which are happening outside of ARM, and yet they're actually very important for ARM. So 1996, VSIA, Virtual Socket Interface Alliance, was formed out in the States. Uh, Cadence was one of the major drivers of this, and their objective basically was to produce um, a library for designing integrated circuits, which was bigger than the sort of um, library that the design tools were incorporating, so more than two input NAND gates, basically. So it would start to include functional blocks like UARTs and so on, and why wouldn't you have a CPU? Now, there was fundamental problems with VSIA, and there was fundamental problems because it was led by Cadence, and that is they had no idea of the, the need for software and how software was very much a part of using something like ARM. So they wanted to consider ARM purely as a cell, as a logic cell because they, that was their domain and that was the area they knew. Now, of course, because they had fairly blinkered views, then VLSI, VSIA Alliance um, never really took off. But there was quite a few things that spun out of it, and we'll come back to those in due course. <clears throat> what we're really saying, though, and I think it's the, from my point of view, the thing about VSIA which was important was a recognition that designing chips had become so complex that you couldn't do it all anymore. You had to accept units of design from somebody else. Um, the reality of it was we weren't doing it yet, but the practicality of it was it was going to need to be done. So it's Moore's Law, quietly sitting in the background. <clears throat> and for that reason, I'll spend a moment and look at it. We've all seen graphs like this. This one comes from the International Technology Roadmap for Silicon 1999. It's quite old, but it's good because it serves a good span. And it is actually one of the only graphs that they produced which has the red line on it as well. So a minor adjustment, and I'll move it up to today. It's log scales. doesn't make that much difference. <coughs> but the red line is important. When ARM was formed in 1990, 1991, we're talking about integrated circuits with around a million transistors on it. Um, the productivity gap, the red line, was highlighted as a major problem. <clears throat> and if you look at it, at those numbers, the translation into person years, you start to understand why. To around a million transistors, you could handle the, uh, the productivity. 100 person years, kind of manageable. And it had been smaller, of course, but projecting it forward, thousands of person years, the methodology wasn't good enough. The methodology had to change. Nobody, didn't, nobody knew how it was going to change, however. They only knew that it needed to change. And verification hadn't even appeared as a, uh, a dot on the horizon at that point. And verification started to crop up as a problem 
uh, around 1999, when uh, where formal methods, uh, sorry, verification languages started to, started to come about. But really, the recognition that you couldn't even look at the outputs of this anymore and see whether it was working properly or not. You had to have a, as big a design problem was actually designing the test bench and the test environment to make it, to establish that it worked. Now that's the SIA on the same graph. Um, and by here, it had all gone belly up. <clears throat> now, from my point of view, these are perhaps the more, more important overlays. These are not uh, developed by anybody else except me. I know that during that time prior to ARM, design teams were low numbers, a few people. Even in the early days, a single person. I designed a chip entirely on my own, including laying it out when I first went into this business. But the single designer became small teams. We had to start to think in terms of designing a chip with more than yourself. How do you communicate with them? Who's going to do what part? How do you establish that they connect together? Small teams, local teams, not just in the same building, not just in the same office, rather in the same building, and ultimately, of course, global teams. Uh, you needed to access everybody who knew how to do anything about it. Those are today's uh, domains. But that, of course, also means when you was just one of you, essentially, you could do a clean sheet design, but it moved through to not any chance of doing a complete uh, clean sheet design. So anybody who's still thinking in terms of research and thinking that chips are designed from a, a clean sheet of paper, got to rethink it. It's not like that anymore. Reuse has come in as the way to close that productivity gap. And we've hardly noticed it. In retrospect, the industry turning point was a nice, nicely timed one for ARM. That's when ARM came on the scene, and all of this reuse thing was just about to happen. And ARM was talking about an IP, CPU as an IP, as a way of delivering the functional possibilities of silicon. It was absolutely, crucially correctly timed, which is why I put it in as a milestone. It was outside ARM, it was circumstance dependent, ARM didn't really think about it. It wasn't on their, uh, on their uh, strategy roadmap, but nevertheless, it worked out right. There was, an, incidentally, other CPUs which are around before ARM. MIPS is one of them. MIPS was also sold as an IP. MIPS didn't time it right. There's another story I can tell about that. Anyway, 1997, Nokia, who'd been busy, so it took them four years to make use of the license, uh, did actually make a baseband processor chip which went into the Nokia phone. Now, it's also in red because this is nothing to do with ARM. We provided the CPU that went into it. It was an affirmation of the modular IP concept and it was the right scale, the right power of processor to enter the market. It was a necessary thing. It was there at the right time. Thumb turned out to be a necessary addition at this point because um, the code that was necessary to, to make this phone work with its menus and its pseudographic display wouldn't fit into a 256K ROM if it, if it just used the standard ARM 32-bit instructions. And so Thumb was created very much on the back of a fag packet from words that had been out in the let's say, the ARM community, the wider ARM community, people had been talking about producing a compacted instruction set. And our people, ARM's people, had looked at that and decided they could do something with it. And so the first thumb, was, the th first thumb instructions were added to the CPU to enable Nokia to get the code into a 256K ROM, which is all they could afford to put into this to make it effective. <coughs> and, of course... That was the first implementation of it. Thumb turned out to be, so very good for code density, also turned out to be a very good uh, for power efficiency. Because if, you're, if your um, instructions and data are only half the width, then you're only doing half the number of fetches. Fetches are one of the big things which consumes me uh, power. And, uh, and therefore, reducing the amount of data that you're fetching turns out to be a, another accidental uh, efficiency in terms of your CPU. So we can again win on power efficiency. 
Um, again, almost accidentally. Excuse me, whenever I say we, it's because I have this history of working for ARM. I'm not we anymore. <clears throat> So anyway, 1998 in April, ARM did its IPO. And it's interesting to look at this. Uh, it was jointly listed on London Stock Market and NASDAQ. And it valued ARM at 26.6 million. So it's interesting to put that down as a, a point in time. Uh, 1998, ARM was worth 26 billion, uh, million. Its revenue was 2.9 million. And there were 350 people working in the company. I joined... 1998 June, by which there were 376 people in there. Now, I put a question mark and an exclamation mark there as to the value of me joining, but we all know it was really large, don't we? Okay. <clears throat> but it just doesn't seem right to blow my own trumpet too loudly. <clears throat> the other thing that happened in 1998 is our move to a Harvard architecture. Uh, it doesn't seem like a major thing, but actually... It was a recognition that performance was starting to be an issue. ARM had never, ever been, th been concerned about the performance of the CPU. It was, it was a low-performance CPU aimed at a whole series of essentially low-performance applications as a cell, giving you programmability. But performance had never been an issue. Moving to Harvard was to the first recognition of a movement to performance. That's why it's on there as a milestone. Also in 1999, before we move off this slide, Arm entered the FTSE 100 for the first time. Robin Saxby got his sir, uh, his knighthood on the basis of that. I think we were there for six months and dropped out again, not to get back to the FTSE 100 until 2010. So ten years later, before we made it back into the FTSE. <coughs> Now, another thing that happened out there in the environment is around 2000, System C made an appearance. Um, System C had actually started in v VSIA. Um, it was a, a group inside VSIA who was rather more concerned about being able to simulate more complex systems. Uh, Cadence were not overly impressed by this. As I'd already said, they were primarily a hardware company. Uh, and so the group span out, span out of VSIA and started this System C consortia. And um, it's the thing that was particularly strong about it was it brought together the recognition of the requirement to, si to simulate, to design hardware, software and system in one consistent environment. We'd never had that before. There'd never been a need for it before, but really the complexity had, had risen to a point where that had become an issue. Uh, facilitated modular design and reuse for SOC. Again, the concept here, these are, it's a system C, it's based on C, it's got objects, and it's, it has the ability, therefore, to take objects and manipulate objects independently of one another. Verilog and VHDL, neither of them had objects in those days, which made reuse very, very difficult. Uh, so again, System C ended up being a, um, a, a lead vehicle, and Verilog and VHDL ultimately followed suit. And in fact, Verilog still dominates that area, but it's incorporated an awful lot of what was originally System C in doing so. It created the demand, and this is an interesting one, it created the demand for a pluggable, fast ARM simulation model. Now, ARM had always done a very um, innovative uh, design methodology based on the use of models. So it had created logic models, and the only processor that it had available for doing its design instantly was the Acorn machines, which it had lots of. And so they'd written a, um, what amounts to a simple high-level description model and a language which ran on the Acorn machines and only on that, and I couldn't find immediately what the name was of, the, of that. It doesn't really matter. But they then, as they took out, uh, as they implemented these individual circuit modules, they were able to drop the circuit equivalent into the system and then run the system again and see it working. So it was very advanced in its day. Uh, and the thing that System C, of course, did was to give you that ability in, in something which was a wider standard. <clears throat> 
Um, the other thing that happened in 2000 was taking 32 bits into smart cards. Smart cards were traditionally the home of the 4-bit processor. Very, very energy efficient, uh, very, very simple. Nothing, nothing much clever going on inside a smart card. And getting a 32-bit arm into it, a low power, A, a secure core, which was a scrambled layout with cr scrambled instructions so you couldn't, you couldn't work out who it was or what the processor was that was in it. But the most significant thing was that it was 32 bits and getting, getting ARM into the smart card market was, uh, was very significant actually. I can't tell you much about that because apart from anything else, inside ARM how much, is, how much SC100 is really used is quite unknown. John probably knows more about it than I do actually. Um, uh, 2001, ARM tried to move into um, DSP, extending from the, uh, the CPU into the signal processing domain. Uh, we had this little 4A a multimedia accelerator move, which was a diversification. And I think it's, uh, the, the reason it's there as a milestone is ARM's DSP activity really stems from then, 2001. We also broke with tradition too. Up until that point, the ARM CPUs had always been supplied as hard macros. You tell us what the process is, you tell us what the rules are, we'll lay it out for you. You can stick it in as a hard macro. But uh, 2001 was the first synthesizable ARM, uh, the 926 EJS. E was, I can't remember what E is. J was Java, S was something else. They all meant something. <laughs> um, the other thing that happened as a result of 2002, we say we've talked about system C, 2002 we actually, ARM actually started producing models which would run with more than one ARM on it or other processes as well. So in other words, these were not ARM centric models. All the models that we had done prior to that time had ARM in the center of them. There was an assumption that there was one ARM Around it was peripherals. Around it, beyond that, was the additionals that you wanted to add to make it into your particular uh, integrated circuit. Uh, this model, 2002, actually moved ARM, the processor, out of the center. So you had an environment in which you could plug several processors, uh, not constrained to ARM, although clearly ARM was what it was made for. <clears throat> Trust zone and prime axis. These are... Um, Trust Zone, I don't know how many of you know it, but Trust Zone is the introduction of a, uh, an operation mode which is below the supervisor mode, which essentially creates a, an area which is protected even from the operating system. Um, it took quite a long time for that concept to be in any way accepted. Why would we need to have Trust Zone below an operating system? Surely the operating system is enough protection in its own right. Um, and actually, so you'll find that if you go and look at the, uh, uh, the current product offering, I think all of our CPUs, all of ARM's CPUs now have Trust Zone incorporated. In it. And of course, it is a cornerstone of anything which is IoT and IoT security related. So it's become very important and it stems from 2003. Prime Axis was the recognition that systems are not easy to put together. And so Prime Axis was a package of assemb assembly tools, basically, to create logic, logic implementations with matching models, with linked to the software design suite, and with the operating systems ready and confirmed. Basically, giving a customer three quarters of the design solution as a package. Now, obviously, 2003, when it was created, it didn't have all of that. It was more of a concept, but 2003 is where it stems from. 2004, ARM acquired Artisan, cell libraries. Nothing to do with ARM. ARM is a CPU company, but we acquired this cell library company. It turns out to have been a very important thing to do. People who are going to buy ARM want to implement it. And this having cell libraries which are matched to the, uh, to the, to the uh, synthesizable implementation of ARM gives you a huge advantage. So it was one of those things which you think, why the hell did you do it? 
And I certainly thought, why the hell did they do that? Turns out to have been a good move. Anyway, by 2004, Arm was shipping, had first shipped more than a billion arms per year. Um, and the headcount had risen to 1,000. Revenue is 150 million. These figures, profit before tax and R&D percentages, more or less stayed about the same uh, as ARM has grown. So 35% of revenue spent on R&D is a very high number. 22 offices in 10 countries. Just a, a milestone. Uh, 2005 then, diversification. We struggled with this, ARM struggled this, with this for a long time. It was difficult to keep the current design up to date, putting in the amount of effort to uh, continue to improve it. And really the writing was on the wall for some time. Uh, and the writing was ARM. It was sitting there waiting for it, wasn't it? The uh, applications processes, the real-time processes, and the embedded processes suddenly recognized that there were actually three different markets. And in fact, for some time, the R part of it didn't really take off. So there was two, but uh, the recognition of the fact that you couldn't have one arm for all applications really stemmed from 2005. And also stemmed from 2005 was Spinnaker, uh, of which this audience will have some knowledge. Um, the thing that, f from my point of view, that, uh, that made it special was it was ARM's first real university research partnership. We've been playing around before that, but actually this one involved releasing ARM IP and trying to do something which wasn't related to a product. It was an idea that was, that was being pursued. Now, we've, ARM has moved on a lot since then, but I think that 2005 was that turning point and Spinnaker was part of it. Anyway, 2006, 15 years Robin Saxby had been driving this thing, and uh, he was going to hand over. He was going to leave, and he was going to hand it over to the young Warren East. Um, Warren, um, he'd, come th he'd, he'd joined ARM later on, but he, as an engineer or an engineer marketeer, and had grown through the, through the business. Um, and everybody really thought that Robin Saxby was what was keeping ARM afloat. And uh, so there was a lot of concern when he went off that actually it might impact um, the, the, the ARM business quite significantly. And in point of fact, it hardly paused. Nothing was noticeable. The share price didn't Twitter. Um, our Robin is still out there. Um, I still keep in contact with him. Um, it was the end of ARM as a startup, though. And in principally, the thing that um, Robin was, was a startup driver. The thing that Warren was, was a steady pair of hands. He was going to grow the company, and that made a lot of difference. And it, re it needed a different kind of leader. And I think credit to Robin was, was that he realized that it wasn't him who, who was going to lead the company through the next phase. And so you know, he may have come under pressure. I don't know. I wasn't in the board. So the detail of that, I don't know. But uh, nevertheless, it was a big step for him. And he's still the same Robin as he ever was. Anyway, 2006, we acquired, ARM acquired Phalanx. Uh, and that really took ARM into the GPUs, into the single processing area. And of course, now Mali and all of the things that stem from that uh, which has become as significant a part of what uh, the new, the current arm is, stemmed from that acquisition in 2006. Um, we also moved in 2006 to an Eclipse-based IDE. Now, that doesn't sound like a major thing to, to announce for it to be a milestone, but from my point of view it is, because what it did was to recognize for the first time that arm was actually a software producer. Up until that point, these were just tools which were shipped in support of hardware. But this is a, a design environment which is going to ease extension, maintain, maintenance, and compatibility. It was going to enable this tool to be a, a, a suitable partner for the, uh, for the hardware, which is going, which is going to be an, in, an incremental part of it. <clears throat> 2007, it hardly seems possible that the iPhone was invented so recently, does it? 
But the iPhone, and again, another external process, uh, defined the smartphone. So what it was, really, uh, all of those other smartphones and the derivatives of it stemmed from this. Um, there was uh, earlier phones which were attempting to, to be smarter than a dumb phone, but they weren't, I think they were called feature phones, weren't they? Uh, but they never really made the same impact as the iPhone did. But from my point of view, this is a milestone in its own right because it established the need for any, ever more energy efficient, high performance, A class processes. Before that, there was actually a problem. The problem was starting to appear. We could make processes ever, ever more powerful, but what were they going to be used for? This suddenly became the market for those processes. So it drove the A-class development. Um, it was for phones, and of course, that was a vulnerability because as soon as the um, smartphone, as soon as the, uh, the iPhone became your only uh, customer for the A-class processor, then you as a supplier become vulnerable. You need to have a broader market than that. Uh, and so when Samsung ent entered the market and other people entered the market, even if they failed, it didn't really matter because those were uh, diversification of the market and also, of course, a re-verification of the IP-based IP business model. And the other thing that happened in 2008 was the MP core. This is important. We now know it's important, but the basis for that decision was that four small area, sorry, four small cores are more energy efficient than one large one. Initially clunky, soon became virtualized, leads on to all of the big little stuff um, and the multi and many cord processes that, uh, that are now being designed. So I said that, I call this from soup to pud, um, thousand, three orders of magnitude difference in CPU size is now in the market at this time. So the ARM, ARM series CPUs and the Marlies from the smallest to the biggest, 50 million transistors, 50,000 transistors. It's that spread, the ARM class of processors, is actually quite a, quite a difference in range of things to be supported. It meant that there were, in the uh, uh, data sheets at that time, 24 processors from six families being supported by ARM. That's moved on quite a lot from an ARM7. It also means all of this lot, um, the ability to create those systems, to wire them up in a, uh, a physical sense that you're going to implement on a chip, but also to support them with a software environment which is going to match the implementation that your application needs. So that cache coherent network, um, the ability to have multiple uh, quad core implementations, um, the DSPs, however many tiles that you wish to have uh, in that. It's a, it's a lot of options and that whole design environment has to be supported in an environment which will allow the customer, the partner, to as rapidly as possible implement a chip which is going to work and implement a system which is going to work. It's very undervalued in the sense that people now churn out some incredibly complex A-class systems and they work. They work pretty well first time. The areas that don't work are the stuff that they add around the edge. Uh, so this is you know, really robust and amazing technology. Uh, Software processes, systems IP, physical IP, it's what ARM is. It's the tools, the libraries, the partners to realize. And I think that's the, the other thing that tends to get forgotten, is that ARM doesn't make anything. We still don't make anything. So all of these guys are actually taking what, what ARM has produced and they're integrating it with their design environments or their products and including it in their life cycle, essentially to produce products. And products are the thing that ultimately sells, and products are the things where the profits are made, and products are the thing that, who provides the cash that flows back down the, uh, the life cycle that funds ARM. But it also funds the research that you guys are doing. So we've got Spinnaker in there, and we've got uh, the, 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 uh, the engineers that have come through the university systems and the research work which is being done in other, uh, in other close departments at the moment. 
these are all really part of that ecosystem. So the thing that ARM can honestly take credit for here is bringing together this very large community where everybody gets value out of it. Now, how many opportunities there are to do this, I don't know. <clears throat> That's another, another version of the same thing, a little bit slightly more ARM-oriented, saying where the ARM tools are in this. But you can also see that the ARMs had to develop these software tools essentially where there are no commercial tools. So putting in the tools, putting in the effort to bring together the individual tools that partners may offer uh, to, to be part of this ecosystem. A lot of those things never made money, still don't make money, but they're part of the package when people buy into ARM. It's why the license costs these days are not cheap. They're valuable, but they're not cheap. And of course, it also means that when you look at the inside of your average smartphone, then ARM doesn't just appear in one chip, not just in the main apps processes, it appears all over the place. So pretty well, all of the chips which are in a smartphone, and frequently there are around 20 chips in a smartphone, most of them will have ARM in there somewhere. And it's phenomenal because it means that when you pick up your smartphone, you're not just picking up an ARM, but you're probably picking up 10 or so ARMs. It's no wonder the numbers that are being shipped are in the billions, because you're, you know, when you pick up a, a reasonably smart piece of electronic systemry these days, then it's got 10 or more processes on board. <clears throat> But there is a simple world, too. And 2008, bottom left, um, <clears throat> aperitif, if you will, we have Embed. Embed turned out in 2008. It was a weekend project by one of the research engineers whose basic uh, motivation for this was, I think it was his wife, or it might have been his kids, but I think it was his wife in those days, uh, who, was, who wanted to have some sort of demonstration of what ARM actually did. And he couldn't do it because we don't make anything. ARM didn't make anything. Therefore, he couldn't take a chip or a phone, which was an ARM phone. And so he, he found that the frustration was that he'd have to buy a, um, a suitable microprocessor development kit and write code. And by the time he put all this lot together with some Veriboard, his wife would have lost interest in it anyway. And so, you know, he, he was frustrated by his own, own inability to, uh, to demonstrate what he did. And so he went away and he created the concept of this little embed device. And in fact, the first one that he produced looks remarkably like that one at the bottom there, which is a production item. But the concept was to enable Joe Public to design a microcontroller-based system, making the software design environment essentially invisible, making the code generation essentially easy, so really good libraries to make code readable code and simple code to write. And it uses C, but it uses a, a form of C which is more, let's say, readily understandable, wordy form of C. It turned out, um, to be very difficult. Uh, there was a, uh, a guy in marketing and uh, another guy on the board, I think it might have been Mike, Bull Mike Muller actually, who thought that it was a good idea and for a long time it just sort of hung around and nobody really made any money out of it. Um, and it, it kept getting new bosses and it kept moving around because the thing was, it was IoT before anybody had a name for it. And so it was it was a bit of a, a lost item. It felt like a good idea, but there was nobody making money out of it. Um, now, 2009, another red line, so something else happening outside, which influenced ARM. <clears throat> and this was uh, uh, Microsoft's uh, Natal project, project, which ultimately became known as Connect. Um, this was very interesting. Uh, it applied deep learning technology uh, concepts um, for posture recognition. The thing that was startling about this was the implementation of it just used an ARM7. It was just the standard ARM7 that, uh, that Microsoft had incorporated into a little chip. We knew nothing about what they were going to do in ARM. 
uh, they just put together a chip and they built this system and it was in the research labs in Cambridge. Uh, and essentially what they'd realized was that training neural networks was a really big deal, but replicating them was easy. And so they were able to replicate what amounted to a trained, a trained neural network on an ARM7 fast enough to make that commercial box work. And if you've ever played with them, it's remarkable how well this thing does work. They didn't know how well it was going to work, and it, so it came as a surprise to them to discover that it would track as many as seven figures and their postures on the, in the screen. So they, they didn't design it to track seven figures. They designed it to track one, and it turned out to be able to track up to seven. Now, the thing that I, that I think is important on this one to bear in mind is that ARM doesn't hear about most of the new products that ARM technology is going into. So uh, the first time that ARM knew that, it was in, that, it, that uh, we were involved in this was when Microsoft told us that, they were in, that we were involved in it. Um, so ARM, it also has to try then and anticipate how its technologies will be used to make sure that those capabilities are in place when people choose to use them. That's a pretty tricky game, but actually ARM has done very well at it, which is why I think it's an important point. There's two things in there which are important. One is that training uh, neural networks is much more complicated than using them, and using them is, is uh, very much easier to, uh, let's say it's much more compatible with commercial markets. And of course we're now seeing all of the um, neural network applications where the training part of it is big machines hidden back there, but you're able to do even trivial level voice uh, recognition on your smartphone and distributing it across the network. So even as it gets more difficult, it's not beyond the bandwidth problems of the network for, uh, for voice recognition, for speaker independent voice recognition. Character recognition, the automatic, um, uh, autonomous vehicle uh, activities and recognition of what's, what's going on around is really developments of this. And 2009, from my point of view, is the milestone that made it happen. There's a lot of these milestones, you note, don't actually involve ARM involvement. But 2009, Sprint was formed, and ARM was a partner of this. Sprint was essentially about a structure for packaging and integrating, reusing IP within uh, tool flows. So it's just trying to standardize the description of IP in HTML5, as it happens, as a, uh, as a descriptor box. Um, and it led to all sorts of things. IP exact was the first release of this, which related definitely to hardware. But fundamentally, it enabled the creation of ARM Socrates and uh, CoreLink and CoreSight. Those environments that I talked about, which enabled you to put together the system that you want to have it configured and connected up really was supported by the output which came out of uh, Sprint. Now 2009, some of you will remember the uh, External Research Speakers Conference. I do. <laughs> he does, he does. That's true. Um, this was a uh, first attempt to bring academic research community and ARM engineers together. I maintain that it was a success, but it never really took off. Um, it was great to get all those people together to talk. Uh, there was lots of features about it, and we can talk about it if anybody wants it. And I'm sure those that remember it, remember it, because most of them remember it fondly. It ran for 24 hours. It was a round-the-world video, a real-time video conference, and it was, uh, it was quite fun. Anyway, 2016 has seen that one come about, and uh, the last, last year's one, I understand, was, well, I was there. It was very successful, and it's going to happen again this year, but I can't make it this year, um, and I haven't been invited anyway, so maybe the, there's... Don't look... I know I don't have to be invited. You just have to put the money down. I'm a pensioner. <laughs> my Zimmer frame is outside. My Zimmer frame is, isn't worth as much as it costs to go to this conference. <laughs> so, 2010 Linaro. Again, similar kind of story. 
you wonder why we would want to get involved with this, but Lenaro enabled the creation of a standard architecture for implementation of, of uh, A-class ARM systems, um, essentially driven by putting uh, Linux onto ARM-based platforms. But it's amazing how that has led to things like Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone, or Droid, uh, but pretty well the architecture behind every one of today's ARM-powered smartphones. Um, that is a, again, ARM was a founder, and in fact ARM was one of the drivers of that particular one. But it's something which um, is not one of the major part, parts of a product that ARM produced, but nevertheless was, was a, a, uh, a major milestone in its, in its capabilities. Now, 2011 took ARM into the top right, and this is, this is a bit weird, because ARM is the technology of the smartphone. It's the low-technology electronics in your product type product. Yeah, that's good. <clears throat> and the idea that ARM should be in any way associated with high performance, not just medium performance, but high performance, was totally alien. And yet... Um, People were taking it that way. People were saying, you know, that we could do more with ARM. We could assemble them because they're small, because you can turn them off, because you can assemble them into the configuration that you want. There is a serious danger here that they can get included into, into servers. And even people were talking about HPC machines. And, of course, later on in 2011, when ARM released the V8 uh, architecture, 64-bit, then this really took the roof off. All of a sudden, everybody had to have 64-bit smartphones, and all of a sudden, the HPC community got seriously interested in the, in the prospects of using ARM because of its energy efficiency, you notice. Now, of course, the energy efficiency is not truly the story that it always been cut out to be, but the designs were always designed to be energy efficient as a consideration. So it was not all about highest performance. So in 2012, ARM committed to an A-class TikTok annual event. And that was a, quite, a, quite a challenge, actually, uh, because the commitment to raise the performance of the A-class processor by 25% every year, which essentially meant a new architectural implementation every other year and a tweak in the year between. Now that, from, 20, 20, from 2012 to when I stopped working with ARM, was the current plan. That was actually going ahead. And it was driven by customers. Customers wanted more performance in their products, and they needed to be able to release it at a, at a beat with their, with, to keep themselves ahead of the game. Anyway, 2013 saw Embed relaunched as ARM's primary IoT platform. Uh, this turned out to be somewhat of a retrospective because when you looked around at all of the embedded devices which are out there, uh, more than 90% of them would now classify as IoT. So it's not so much that ARM had been designing for IoT, it's just that IoT turned out to be what ARM has been used for. <coughs> and uh, so Embed was all of a sudden it had a home and it's been made efforts to complement it with the Kyle, Kyle microcontroller development kit and DS5, which is the uh, A-class development kit. Um, so that all makes sense. And 2013 saw the commitment, really, to IoT kit off, kick off. And the acquisition list goes on. So that one is still through to 16. Thanks to Wikipedia, there's somebody out there who's keeping an eye on this, actually. <coughs> I just wanted to, to bring this one up because it's interesting to think that when you were talking about mainframes down here and the only kid on the block was mainframes, that's where the technology went, then the people who were determining the systems and the performance of the systems were the people who were using those few high, um, mainframe devices back there. They were professionals. But as we've moved forward through the years, the volume markets have taken over. And as they've taken over, the users have moved from being professional to consumer, which means that the, the people determining the technologies today are not the professionals, they're the consumers. The professionals have to live with the technology that they get. 
So if you're building a high performance machine down here, which you can still legitimately call a mainframe computer, then it's got to be using the technology which comes out of the leading volume, the leading value markets. Now, mobile internet has been where we're at till now, and uh, the internet of things is going to see some changes. It's not all going to be about the smallest geometry anymore. It's going to be about system integration. So you're going to see integrations of technology. You're going to see 3D. You're going to see um, packaging technologies. These are the things which are going to make IoT type products. And those are the things which are ultimately going to drip, drip down to the professional markets, the mainframes, the minis, and the desktops and personals. Anyway, 2013. Trying not to go on for too long. Uh, Warren East, now significantly less hair from the earlier picture, um, is uh, replaced by Simon. Simon has an advantage here because he starts off with less hair. Um, again, the world only looks on in wonder. No, no, the world doesn't end. Seven years has been enough for Warren to lose his hair. Um, but now to take arm um, into the IoT era into the 100 billion arms per year era. That's a big number. That's 10 arms for everybody on the planet, basically speaking. <clears throat> um, then Simon seems to be doing a pretty good job on that. The world, the financial world and others accepted him. Everybody in arms thinks he's great. He's one of them. He's an engineer. He genuinely is an engineer. He joined arm as a design engineer and has grown through the company. ARM has got this engineering in its blood, and I think that's an important part of the nature of ARM. It's, it is actually quite a, uh, an understated company in, in many ways, um, despite its success and so on. One of the things that you'll notice, genuinely notice, is that the uh, Simon's office is just like an ordinary um, office just off the, the street in, the, in ARM. There's nothing very special about it. It's not hidden... Uh, behind a safety security desk or a secretary or anything like that. <clears throat> anyway, 2014 saw something which I think is quite significant, and that is I did a talk at the ARM General Engineering Conference. And it, was, it was one that I was asked to do because I'd been talking to some other engineers inside ARM about what research meant in terms of its, its presence inside a business. And the new chairman, who was only in, office, in place by about two months at that time, sought me out afterwards and wanted me to explain to him in more detail what it meant. Uh, I believe he got the message, because the following year, ARM's R&D group was remodeled into ARM's research. And uh, with a clear research mandate and responsibility to the development group, and an immediate upscale, very immediate upscale, of all the research and partnering research activities happened from then. And I think that that's a major thing for ARM to have achieved. And if I don't, if I can just claim a little part of that, I'd be very pleased. It's a lifetime ambition. Anyway, 2016-17 turned out to be a, big, a very big year for ARM. Uh, not only did we move into the, or the world moved us into the HPC arena with Fujitsu, the uh, Mont Blanc project, uh, and EPSERC with Isambard, all saying that they wanted to make uh, exascale or high-performance um, HPC machines based on ARM. I mean, ARM is never going to stand in the way of anybody who wants to do this. And so ARM uh, worked and produced the SVE, Scalable Vector Extensions, essentially, which those customers had been talking to ARM about doing. So it's a, the way that ARM works is uh, it listens to customers. And some of the customers are very clever customers. And uh, if they're talking sense, then it does it. So by uh, late 16, 17, we have ARM compute libraries, uh, dynamic system architecture, that's true. Um, uh, HPC support applications, these are core applications, compilers, debug tools, profiling tools, um, the Linux BSD, Parallelism tools and libraries, maths extensions, file systems, workload managers, Python packages and utilities, all ported over to a virtual ARM HPC machine. Now that's 
not something which has got business behind it. This is all arm doing it because it seems like a good idea and the partners have said that they're interested in using arm. Arm is a partner-led company. December 16, it acquired a linear software, HPC debugging software. Um, the, all right, the rest of it you can read yourself. But I mean, you're seeing there a big commitment. But of course, the other thing that happened in 2016, 17, was the SoftBank acquisition. Of course, this is very interesting, because apart from anything else, at £17 a share, it meant that quite a lot of people in Arm were making quite a lot of pocket money out of this. Um, <clears throat> the SoftBank interest was predominantly in IoT, although it wanted to continue the rest of the business. I think the, the major opportunity that was seen was the IoT, because IoT is highlighted on uh, pretty well everybody's marketing charts as way up and to the top right, which is a good place to be. And so Matsui-san, is, is that what he's called? I can't remember his name. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> he was he, very uh, verbose about that. Um, also made other commitments along the way to keep the HQ in the UK, double the UK staff in the next five years, grow the rest of the world business. In other words, not to let money be any kind of limitation, uh, but really to, to develop the potential of ARM. That means quite an interesting read, and that's public information, and I've given you the, the link to it at the bottom so you can read it yourself. It's the email that went to um, ARM, oh, that's all right, ARM partners. <clears throat> anyway, it took six weeks, that's all. 1st of September, six weeks later, ARMS delisted, SoftBank hands over £24.3 billion to ARM, limit, ARM Holdings investors. So that's the people who took the money, it's the investors, but of course ARMS employees were all shareholders, one way or the other, may have sold some along the way, but they mostly have got some because they get some every year. And all of the shares all of the shareholders took a share of it. Now, a lot of arms investment investors would have been out of the country. A lot of them are pension funds. Um, but nevertheless, there was, of 24 billion, there's a, there's a lot to go around. Okay. 24 billion is a big number. It's 24 and 9 <gasps> O's. <laughs> anyway, six weeks and the acquisition was completed. So where was arm before SoftBank? Well, 2016, the revenue was 150 million, which was, if you look at those IPO values, 26 million value, it's now valued at 24 billion. So broadly speaking, a thousand times more valuable. The revenue was 150 million versus 2.9. So that's 50 times more revenue. And the heads, broadly 10. So 10 times the number of heads, 50 times the amount of revenue, and 1,000 times the, uh, the value on the stock market. Interesting to look at. But that's what happened over those 26 years. Well, not 26 years. It's 26 years minus the time before ARM first did its IPO, so 1998. Let's say getting on, it's uh, 17 years, isn't it? So ARM's headcount was 4,022 offices, 1,750 in the UK, uh, shipping at the rate of 20 billion per annum last, the last year it was reported. Uh, hits 100 billion total shipped by February this year. Now the thing about it is it's been driven by an evolving technical mission and it's staffed by people who believe it, in it. Arm has never been one of those companies where the customer is dissociated from you. You are part of it. And it's, it is very definitely a unique thing about the, the culture of Arm. And it's one of the things I enjoyed most about Arm. You felt that you were doing something. No matter what it was, it was a share in that thing. You also felt that the managers were just doing something which was more complicated. Yeah, they were going to get paid more, but these poor souls are working 24 hours a day. They're working really hard. They're not just sitting back in some fur-lined office swanning around the world. They're working very hard. So everybody felt part of a partnership. It was financially cautious. It didn't just make itself bigger because it had the money. It had a billion pounds in the bank at 1% interest, as uh, one of our uh, financial guys told us. It wasn't making a lot of money. <clears throat> 
But it was owned by its in international investor community since its IPO, 1998. So it's not been a UK company since then. <clears throat> but its board was independent, and the chairman represented the investors' interests. I think we're on the last but one slide. Can't tell on this thing. <clears throat> anyway, as a soft bank company, it's still owned by international investors. But now SoftBank is 50% of the board, so they have a lot more direct influence over what ARM does than that, in, than that investment community did before. This is speculation, I, I'm hasten to add. I don't know that this is true, but from the outside, this is kind of inevitable. Um, investment companies are motivated by financial returns somewhere. So they're not interested, they're not primarily motiva motivated by technology anymore. These guys are motivated by making money. Uh, they will tolerate technology as a means to this end, but that's not what it's fundamentally about anymore. Uh, money is now not an obstacle to its growth, because this is an investment community. They know people with very deep po pockets. But on the other hand, we had a billion in the bank beforehand, so it wasn't really much of a problem anyway. Now ARM needs to set and drive the agenda, and that is a fundamental change of ethos. ARM has been a close listener, a striver with lead partners, but it's never been a leader. And this is a fundamental change, and I'm not sure how easy it's going to be to change. SoftBank is legally bound because of the monopolies and mergers uh, agreement in the UK to double the ARM UK headcount before 2021. In reality, in the UK, that means they have to employ around 500 people a year for the next two or three years. That's about five times the number of people that have been employed per year in the, in the run-up to this. That is a huge recruitment problem. Now, you can do it by recruiting new people, or you can do it by acquiring businesses. But you don't just want to acquire arbitrary businesses. ARM historically has acquired businesses which were very closely aligned to its strategy and its business and its plans. Now, perhaps you're going to have to acquire heads here because you are legally obliged to have that number of heads in the company by 2021. <clears throat> Similarly, if you're not careful when you acquire these companies, you acquire their culture, not yours. And so you buy a big company, and it's got a culture. So it can be Rolls-Royce or British Airways or something like that. And they're not remotely interested in technology, and they want fur-lined offices. So it's a, it's a different culture. And that's not going to be an easy thing. That change is not going to be an easy thing for ARM to manage. And I seriously do wish them great luck with it. So my last slide. <clears throat> There's a lot of milestones there along the top. And that's not all of the milestones by any means. Those are just the ones that I saw as major turning points. You can consider that every one of those could have been places at which ARM chose the wrong route, but it chose the right route in that they, le they led forward to better things. Now, luck is a part of business. It's an unavoidable part of business. But was ARM that lucky to be serially lucky through all of those milestones? I don't think it was, but I, you also know that plans are really only vague directions of indication. It's like plans for Brexit, you know. We are going to leave Europe. We don't actually know much about what that's going to mean. And mostly plans, we want to go into DSP, we want to go into IoT, we want to get into, you know, these are architectural decisions. They're not precision implementations. There are too many key milestones in ARM's history for luck to be the only explanation of success. And I think that's, that's something to think about. And I went looking to see what I could find. And probably this one from somebody called Peter Drucker, who is apparently some sort of wizard, but I like the, uh, the quote anyway. Culture eats strategy for, visit for breakfast. And I like that. ARM has had culture. That's true enough. There is this thing called ARM. And... It's been true to itself. It's, uh, it was led by a bunch of engineers who were engineers. They were enthusiastic about the, about the dream, and they brought along everybody else as part of the implementation of that dream. In many respects, they were not classic businessmen. They hadn't read all of the business books. They hadn't been to Harvard. They hadn't 
uh, in many respects when they started doing this, done their business school qualifications. Um, so they didn't know how to do it properly. So that Arm was a different company, didn't matter. It was just a company. Its business model was novel, didn't matter. Let's just make it happen. And I think that that, again, is, is one of the fundamental things which has brought this forward. It is the capabilities and the culture and the strategy were all aligned in Arm. And that's important, I think, because it made those things happen. People chose to go in a way which felt like it was the right way and then they uh, helped to make it happen because they all believed in it. And they, um, <clears throat> the culture was such that we wanted to make a success out of it and did. And that everybody was involved in it. Everybody was involved in it. There was no people down there in the office who weren't part of Arm, Arm's dream. And I think everybody felt that they were involved. There was good rewards got share allocations every year of which 25% were realized every year and he got bonuses retrospective and forward-looking it made partners out of everybody and the customers liked and continue to like the risk sharing business model a license which is an upfront investment and a royalty a share in the success of the end product this made customers into partners so we've got customers who are partners and you've got people inside the business who are partners. We're all interested in the success of ARM. It's like ARM was just this big cloud of people who were, who were all self-interested, but making the thing work, worked. <clears throat> ARM is its biggest competitor. That 25% tick-tock beat, make your own products obsolete before your competitors can do it. This is, you know, our, ARM's hardest a competitor is itself, and that's the way it's got to be. You don't sit on your cash cows. Winning is not stable, as I was talking about it to Andrew earlier. There's no winning post in this game. We're just in front at the moment. And that's it. Partnerships up, down, and inside is the winning formula for business. It's been the winning formula for ARM, and I hope it can, can, can maintain it during the next phase. And that literally was my last slide. So 2017... We'll have to have John up here to give, to give the next chapter. So thank you very much for listening.